So we'll start with the review of the normal anatomy of the organs that can be seen via transabdominal or transvaginal ultrasound, and importantly, the relationship of the organs to one another. So starting in this view in this schematic right here, starting from the anterior, you have your pubic symphysis right here. Generally, if you're gonna do a general transabdominal ultrasound, you're gonna place your probe right around here on the pelvis. You're gonna see, hopefully not through the symphysis, you're gonna to have to place it slightly above to image here through the bladder. The bladder you want to be nicely distended, and that's for two reasons. It's gonna push any small bowel loops up and out of the way because ultrasound can't see well through bowel loops. And it's also gonna serve as a window because ultrasound waves travel faster through fluid. So using that urine in a nicely distended bladder will help you to see the next organ right behind it, which is the uterus here. Back here is gonna be the vagina right here with the fornices, anterior, posterior, and cervix right here. And then behind that, we of course have the rectum posteriorly back here. Here's a labeled one where you can get a little bit more detail if that's helpful to you. And again, this is the bladder here. You have your vagina here, your anterior, your posterior fornix of the vagina. The external os of the cervix is right here. And then the internal os can be variably difficult to see but should be somewhere right around here. That's when the endometrium is gonna start and you have your anterior portion of the endometrium and your posterior portion of the endometrium. So that's gonna cover the lower uterine segment of the uterus, the body, and then the fundus of the uterus right here. And again, posterior to this is going to be the rectum. Again, moving to this unlabeled view right here. It's important to remember too, when you're going to do a transvaginal approach to imaging, the cervix and uterus can be mobile. So it can look different on your imaging depending on where it is at that particular time at that particular day when you're imaging it. This is an example. The uterus can be anterior, sort of flopped anteriorly onto the bladder here, or it can be more posterior position as it is here. And remember, it's important because if you're doing transvaginal imaging, your fixed plane of imaging is going to be via the vagina and you don't have a whole lot of wiggle room there to image this. So generally the patient's going to be placed supine on the table when you're doing a transabdominal view. Again, you're gonna fill that bladder as much as possible to get rid of the bowel gas, pushing that up and out of your image field of view. And generally you're gonna use the five curve as your general probe for transabdominal imaging. The transvaginal probe, however, is a high frequency probe. That means you're gonna get high resolution imaging, very beautiful pictures, but because the frequency is high, those ultrasound waves are not going to go very far before they get lost to form the image. Therefore, you have a limited distance of what you can view. However, we don't image patients in an upright position. Generally, we're gonna see them as supine as we do here. So that transabdominal view, again, you're gonna put that probe directly onto their anterior pelvis right here. You're gonna use the bladder as a window to visualize the cervix and the uterus itself. That's gonna create an image that looks like this. So here is your five curb probe will be up here. This is gonna be your skin subcutaneous fat, soft tissue, some musculature. Then you have your anechoic bladder right here, which is nicely distended, creating a beautiful window so that you can see the uterus. We have vagina down here, cervix is right around here, lower uterine segment right around here, and the body of the uterus. And here the fundus is a little bit obscured due to bowel gas that didn't quite get pushed out of the way here. You also have some of the endometrial contents right here and a little bit of free fluid in the cul-de-sac. However, transvaginally, you have a limited field of view here. Again, we talked about the high frequency waves. So you're gonna get beautiful uh, imaging, high spatial resolution, but it's not gonna go very far, the waves as they travel before they get lost to form that image. You're also limited by a fixed plane of imaging as we mentioned before. You can see in this example here, the ultrasound waves may be sending waves in these different directions, but it's not necessarily gonna capture all of the uterus in a single plane right here due to that limited field of view. So it's always important to remember when you're measuring a structure, particularly the uterus, you may not get it in one field of view. So your imaging may not be perfectly accurate when you're looking for length of different structures. Another thing to remember when you're doing transvaginal imaging is now you want the bladder to be decompressed. So that patient's gonna to need to empty their bladder. And that's for two reasons. Number one is patient comfort. It's really uncomfortable to have a transvaginal probe there and to have a full bladder. Number two is if this bladder is overly distended, you can imagine it's gonna push that top of the uterus back. And if it gets too far in a sort of upright position, it may actually be too far to get good images of it because remember high frequency probe, you need short distance to get those beautiful images. So two things there to keep in mind. So with that all being said, are we ready to look at some ultrasounds? Okay, 
So this is a image from a sagittal uterus. This is labeled right to left. So I took this from a cine clip, but just to give you an idea of what we're looking at, this is your transvaginal probe right here. It's much more curved than the other one was a sharper curve there. You can also see in the corner right here that it's a nine. That's a much higher frequency than your general five curve that you're going to be using. So this is going to be in the fornix of the vagina. You don't really see the vagina here again because the probe is within it. So what you're seeing here is what is up against it. So in this particular image, we don't really see the cervix that well. Again, there might be a bend to the uterus, which doesn't allow you to see it perfectly in one single plane. But here is the anterior part of the uterus. So lower uterine segment, body, fundus coming around here, and then posteriorly, uterine body, lower uterine segment, and then we get down to the cervix down here. Back here is going to be rectum. You might also have some mesenteric fat. You might have some bowel loops nearby, depending on what's there on that given day. More centrally, you're going to have the endometrial lining, which will vary depending on the stage of menstrual cycle. And then oftentimes you can see the arcuate arteries of the uterus kind of going all the way around right here, especially if you put on color Doppler. Here it's important to remember that the size of the uterus varies depending on the age of the patient. When they're pediatric, it's going to be small and it's going to grow to reproductive age about eight to nine centimeters in length. It may be larger if the woman is multiparous rather than null paris woman. So more kids, you may have a larger uterus just in general. It then starts to decrease in size in the postmenopausal status. And then it depends on how far postmenopausal you are. It can get down to three and a half centimeters in length if you're very remote from your menopause onset. And then, of course, endometrium is going to vary depending on the stage of the cycle in the reproductively aged woman. And we'll go over some of those in a little bit.